Yeah. So welcome all. So today our topic is regarding biomolecules. Okay. So let's begin with the topic. What is biomolecules? Biomolecules are nothing but the molecules, compounds, both organic as well as inorganic elements. All these things, whatever you find in the living organisms, we call it as biomolecules. It may be organic. So you can see organic or inorganic. Or inorganic. So protoplasm is the living substance. So it possesses the biological properties. We will be having a protoplasm. So first of all, what is this protoplasm? So protoplasm is equal to cell minus cell wall plus cell membrane is protoplasm. I hope you got the point. What is protoplasm? Cell minus cell wall plus cell membrane. So protoplasm has motion because of cyclosis. We have amoeboid. And Brownian. Brownian movement. These movements depend on age of the cell, amount of water, enetic factors, and chemical composition of protoplasm. Protoplasm exhibit irritability when provided stimuli. So protoplasm will exhibit irritability. So let's see the sensitivity of protoplasm to external stimuli. So the sensitivity of the protoplasm to the external stimuli, we call it as irritability. So the transmission of stimuli from one place to another place, we call it as conductivity. Conductivity is the transmission of the stimuli from one place to another. Because irritability and conductivity, they both occur in protoplasm. So of many cells, example, nerve cell, muscle cell, etc. Different chemical reactions takes place in protoplasm. Constructive reactions called anabolic. So we have uh, some of all the metabolic, some of all the reactions that happens in the living organism, we call it as metabolism. This metabolism is so far divided into two categories. First one is anabolic reaction. Anabolic reaction is constructive in nature. So it synthesizes the different types of biomolecules. And the very opposite is catabolic. So catabolic reactions are destructive in nature. It releases energy. Anabolic reactions, we call it as endothermic because it stores energy. Catabolic reactions, we call it as exothermic because it liberates the energy. So here heat is released. Here heat is stored actually. Here heat is released. Here ATP is stored. Here ATP is released or liberated. And next, the process of capacity to the external material to resynthesize them in a new form. So protoplasm has this capacity for taking the external material and resynthesizing into some other form, which we call it as assimilation. You, you have seen this terminology in digestion and absorption. Digestion, absorption and assimilation. Because we are converting the carbohydrates to final part as glucose. And we are converting the fats as glycerol and fatty acids. Proteins as amino acids, which is called assimilation. And respiration as well as excretion process. All these things will happen in protoplasm. Respiration will happen in protoplasm and excretion will happen in protoplasm. 
so these are all the uh, basic pro biological properties of finally these are the biological properties of protoplasm irritability conductivity metabolism assimilation respiration and excretion next thing we are going to see the chemical nature of protoplasm so let's see the chemical nature of protoplasm that is approximately we have 34 elements 34 elements participate in the composition of protoplasm but only 13 elements are universal elements of protoplasm out of 34 only 13 elements are universal they are carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen chlorine calcium potassium sodium sorry phosphorus sorry phosphorus sodium potassium sulfur magnesium iodine and iron these are the 13 elements that plays a very key role and universal for all the protoplasm once again carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen chlorine calcium phosphorus sodium potassium sulfur magnesium iodine and iron so car so and mainly out of this the carbon hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen will form 96% of protoplasm okay rest of the elements of protoplasm occurs in very small quantities which is around 0.756 percentage so that's therefore they call as trace elements because they are very limited trace elements out of 13 only this four are the major remaining nine we call it as the trace elements so the trace elements let's include copper cobalt manganese zinc boron vanadium chromium tin silicon fluorine molybdenum nickel selenium and arsenic so these are the remaining elements which are trace 0.756 percentage is occupied so let's see so let's see the percentage of elements here so the maximum amount that you will get in the human body is oxygen so which is uh, 62 percentage will be of oxygen the second place will goes to carbon which is of 20 percentage and hydrogen 10 percentage and next nitrogen which is of 3 percentage so remaining all are trace elements which you will be getting like uh, less than 2 percentage and calcium which is 2.5 percentage so just remember about these things so oxygen six major percentage is oxygen 62 percentage carbon 20 hydrogen 10 nitrogen 3 calcium 2.5 remaining all are trace elements like uh, phosphorus chlorine sulfur potassium magnesium magnesium iodine and iron there is a wide variety of wide diversity in living organisms in our biosphere now a question that arises in our mind is 
are all the living organisms are made up of same elements and compounds you have learned in chemistry how this elemental analysis is performed okay so if we perform such an analysis on plant tissue animal tissue are a microbial based we obtain a list of elements like carbon hydrogen oxygen we get several other also but uh, uh, you will be getting all similar type of elements both living as well as non living things and about among all the living things also you have same number of same uh, same number of uh, elements and same type you will be getting but the percentage will be varying if some analysis same analysis is done on the piece of earth okay if we are doing the same analysis on piece of earth piece of earth crust and which is an example of non living matter and we obtain a similar list there are the difference between the two list in absolute terms no such differences can be made out all the elements are present in the sample of earth crust are also present in the sample of is equal to living tissue so in both the things you can find the same thing so however the closer examination will really reveal that the relative abundance of carbon hydrogen with respect to other elements are higher in any living organisms than in the earth crust for example if you see the elements if you see the carbon so let's see the or else go with oxygen which is 46.6 percentage on earth crust and in the living organisms it is 65.0 which is on human body and next if you consider on the earth carbon which is of 0.03 percentage here it is 18.5 percentage next if you see hydrogen 0.14 percentage here it is 0.5 percentage so the nitrogen is very little very 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 minimal and here it is 3.3 percentage if you see so these are the main elements if you see in the earth crust the silicon silicon is of 27.7 percentage here it is negligible so these are the differences you have to refer but oxygen is more percentage on earth crust and living tissue next oxygen carbon hydrogen nitrogen these are present have a higher importance these are present with a somewhat uh, a better numbers so because these have a very higher importance let's see the compounds of protoplasm so although some elements occur in protoplasm as free ions but almost two or more elements are variously co combined to form different kinds of compounds let's see the inorganic compounds coming to the inorganic compounds you have water usually inorganic will not have carbon organic is carbon compounds 70 to 90% is of water and we have salts acids bases gases are of 1 to 3 percentage and next organic compounds organic are of proteins lipids carbohydrates so proteins is of 10 to 15 percentage and lipids are of 2 percentage carbohydrates is of 3 percentage and nucleic acids nucleic acids is of 5 to 7 percentage so these are percentages of organic compounds 
Oh, out of all water, water will be ninety five percent. So we have free water, and five percent will occur in bounded form in the body. And uh, actually, in the total body weight, sixty five to seventy percent of the total body weight is of water. And in human body, we have around forty liters of water. You know that in human body, it is around. Forty liters of water, and in that also fifty-five percent is intracellular inside the cell, and forty-five percent is extracellular. And in the animal kingdom, the hardest material will be. Enamel. In the animal kingdom, the hardest material is enamel. And in the plant kingdom, the hardest material is sporopollenin, which you can see. For the exine layer of the pollen grain, sporopollenin, and you have, can see the salts, some metallic and the other ions such as magnesium, iron, zinc, molybdenum, manganese, etc., uh, acts as cofactors for enzymatic uh, activities. So we have osmotic pressure. so chemical exchange of protoplasm for its environment is maintained by these ions and some also will act as a cofactors let's see the cofactors if you see the zinc it will act as a cofactor for carbonic anhydrase there is a speciality for this enzyme this is the fastest acting enzyme in the whole universe and iron so ferric ions will be for aconitase and catalase copper it is of tyrosinase and magnesium This is for the cofactor for the respiratory enzymes like kinase, enolase, and dehydrogenase. And nickel, urease enzyme. some other functions of the ions are sodium potassium ions for now induction so sodium potassium pump and we have calcium magnesium so this is for muscle contraction and reduce more excitability even for reducing the excitability also we need uh, calcium magnesium of nerves and muscles and calcium is mainly for only calcium is for blood clotting blood clotting bone formation and the most abundant mineral element in the animal body is calcium so sodium and potassium is the main solution for main component for ringer solution
and potassium ions is very much helpful for stomatal opening and closing okay okay so let's begin with the chemical analysis so what is chemical analysis in order to know the organic compounds in a living thing so we do such an analysis which we call it as chemical analysis so take a living tissue so assume it as a vegetable piece of liver or anything so first thing is living tissue after taking a living tissue we have to grind it so grind with trichloroacetic acid cl3cooh cl3cooh so trichloroacetic acid is been taken by using mortar and so mortar and pestle so we get a very thick slurry if we strain if we want to strain this on cheese cloth so again this thick slurry has to strain on a cheese cloth so after straining into the cheese cloth we get two things one is filtrate which we call it as acid soluble pool and other one is retentate which is called acid insoluble pool so scientists have thousands of organic compounds in the acid soluble all the carbon compounds we get from the living tissue are called biomolecules so all the carbon compounds all the carbon compounds carbon compounds which is present in the living tissue is called as biomolecules however living organisms have also got inorganic elements and compounds in them weights a small amount of living tissue say it as a leaf or okay this is another analysis which is elemental analysis now we are going with elemental analysis so let's see about this elemental analysis what is this elemental analysis you are taking a piece of living tissue okay and after this living tissue say it as a leaf or liver you have to take a wet weight and next you have to dry it so after drying water will go off h2 h2o will go off because around 75% of the body is water right and the remaining material you have to go with dry weight now if the tissues is fully burnt so you have to fully burnt it all carbon compounds will get oxidized and co2 and vapor water vapor will go off so what is remaining we call it as ash the ash contains inorganic elements like so this ash contains calcium 
magnesium, etc. And inorganic compounds such as sulfates, phosphates, etc. are also seen in acid soluble fraction. Therefore, elemental analysis will give elemental composition and chemical analysis will give organic uh, compounds composition. So, in this elemental analysis, we can see how hydrogen, oxygen, chlorine, carbon, etc. are forming the compounds. So, we'll give an idea how organic and inorganic compounds constituent in the living tissue. From the chemistry point of view, one can identify the functional group as well, such as aldehydes, 